sit down and just, I don't want this to just be a, um, a Sunday night singing. What I want to do is I want to worship to this just like we would on a Sunday morning or any other time that we gather to worship God uh, in this place. Because if you know me, the only time that I am serious is right here. <laughs> so <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, and, then, and then cut the deck on that one. Um, and Logan said, yep. Uh, but anyway, I want to worship God tonight. And so uh, let's do that. Let's pray and let's get into this. Father, we're so grateful just for the way you showed up this morning. Yeah, just the, um, the freedom that we operated in worship this morning. Just the freedom through your word. Uh, just realizing what our faith can do. Uh, God, and, and, and I'm so grateful that you would just meet with us. And right now, I just ask for your Holy Spirit to do the same. Just come in here and just settle our spirits. Settle our hearts. Let us worship you, God. God, you have always gone before. You are just a great healer. You are a great provider. You are our everything. And so, God, we just worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. They tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Tell me of a home far away Oh, they tell me of a home Where no storm clouds rise Oh, they tell me of a non-clouded day Let's sing this out Oh, the land of a cloudless day Oh, the land of a non clouded sky Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone they Tell me of a land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Here we go. Oh, the land of a cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise oh they tell me of an unclouded day oh they tell me of a king in his beauty there tell me that my eyes shall behold where he sits on the throne that is wider than snow in the city that is made of gold Oh, the land of a cloudless day Oh, the land of an unclouded sky Oh, they tell me of a home Where no storm clouds rise Oh they tell me of an unclouded day. Sing this out. They tell me that he smiles on his children there. Smile drives this sorrow away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again. In that lovely land of an unclouded day And oh, the land of a cloudless day Oh, the land of an unclouded sky Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise Oh, 
they tell me of an unclouded day. Now worry about tomorrow All the troubles to come The lilies now thinking about the season The drought or the flood A tree that's planted by the water Isn't faced by the fire So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me you take good care of me You know what I need Before I even ask a thing Cause you hold me in your hands With the kindness that never ends I'm carried by your love No matter what the future brings Cause you take good care of me Now worry about the winter Cause soon it will pass The light's now thinking about the darkness Or the shadow it casts A heart that's planted in forgiveness Doesn't dwell in the past So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me you take good care of me You know what I need Before I even ask a thing Cause you hold me in your hands With the kindness that never ends I'm carried by your love No matter what the future brings Cause you take good care of me must be more but I can't get past your kindness I know there's got to be more but I can't get past your goodness I know there must be more but I can't get past your kindness I know there's got to be more but I can't get past your goodness Cause you take good care of me You take good care of me You know what I need before I even ask a thing Cause you hold me in your hands With the kindness that never ends I'm carried by your love No matter what the future brings you take good care of me. All right, if you got your Bible, go ahead and grab that. Be in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. We're going to actually spend the next three weeks in verses 3 through 14. If you got a pen or a highlighter, Grab that, if you don't mind writing and marking in your Bible. If you do mind writing and marking in your Bible, get over it, do it anyway. This is Bible study, not Bible read. We're going to read it, and we're going to study it, and we're going to break it down. Ephesians 1, 3-14, let me voice a prayer for us, and we will get to work. Father, thank you so much for today. God, thank you just for another opportunity to come back sing to you father now just to transition to get into your word uh father just this text scares me father just let us have integrity with it um just let us point to you not not to what we might think 
But just let, let the text point to the saving knowledge of Christ. And that's what we're trying to pull out tonight. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get in it. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 3. We will bounce around a little bit, but we'll always come back to Ephesians like we do uh, every week to our main text, our main topic. So keep your finger there, keep something there as we go around a little bit. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. To the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Verse 11. In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will, in order that we who were first to hope in Christ might be the praise of His glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, the praise of His glory. If you don't mind taking note or making note of the phrases predestined, adopted, purposed, chosen. Do that as we go through this text over the next couple of weeks. Verses 3-14 through 14 is actually a prayer. In the Greek, it is one long sentence. So if you were to read this in original Greek, it would just be one long sentence. But this text shows us that God is the one who takes the action. This prayer consists of past, present, and future of God's purpose for the church. Now, let's break this down a little bit. Paul outlines God's master plan for salvation. In verses 3-7, through seven, we are shown the past, which is God's election. So just verse 4, we're not going to read every bit of that because we're going to do a lot of reading tonight. But So 3-7 through seven shows us the past, which is God's election. Verse 4 again. For He chose us in Him when? Before the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in His sight. Then in verses 7-11, through 11, we are shown the present, which is God's redemption through Christ. So verse 7, just for the emphasis. In Him, that is Christ, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Then in verses 12-14, through 14, we are shown the future, which is our inheritance. So verse 14 again. Who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of His glory. Now the overview of these verses is that God has blessed us in Christ. He has chosen us in Christ. He has destined us for adoption. God's grace has been freely given to us. God has made known to us the mystery of His will. God will then gather all things up in Christ and God accomplishes all things according to His divine counsel and His divine will. God was and He is at work in our lives before we are aware of it. Before we could even respond to God, He was already at work in us. God has a plan for us. That plan is rooted in His grace. Now, there's some stuff in this text that God does, and there's some stuff in this text that we do. Now, God does way a whole lot more than what we do. But let me just point it out to you. First, what God does. Verse 3. He blesses. Verse 3 again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Verse 4. He chose us. For He chose us in Him. Verse 5. He predestined us. He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, I was worded in your Bible. Verse 6. He gives us grace. To the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us. Verse 7. He redeems and forgives. In Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness 
of sins. Verse 8, He lavishes on us. That He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Verse 9, He made known. And He made known to us the mystery of His will. Verse 10, He unifies to be put into effect when the times would have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together, that's unification, together under one head, even Christ. Verse 11, He works out everything. In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with His purpose and will. And then in verse 13, He seals us. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, He does a whole lot for us. What do we do? Not very much, but I'll tell you anyway. Verse 12, we hope in Christ. So verse 12 again. In order that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be the praise for His glory. And then in verse 13, we hear and believe. So verse 13 again. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in Him with the seal of the Holy Spirit. So what is our part in salvation? We do the sinning. God does the saving. And that's it. So as you can see just in the text, that God does a whole lot more than we do. Because we really can't do nothing. Our simple thing that we do is this. We hope in Christ. We hear the word. And we just respond by believing the word. That's it. That's all we do. That's all we can do. We do the sinning. God does the saving. Now here's the big question about this text. Why did God choose me? And why did God choose you? Well, to answer that question, we got to go way back a long way. So keep your finger in, there in, in Ephesians, and let's go way back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. I need to quit saying that, Deuteronomy. I say it to be funny with little kids, but I done got stuck on it now. You know, if you say something so many times, you, just, you keep saying it that way? So y'all probably going to tell somebody, man, the preacher can't even say Deuteronomy right. But Deuteronomy chapter 7. I know my English is bad. But, mm. So why did God choose me? Why did God choose you? I want you to notice the wording in this uh, while we're looking at it. Deuteronomy 7, I'm going to trust you got it, so let's start in verse 7. 7 through 9 actually. The Lord did not set His affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other people. What He said is, you ain't that special. For you were the fewest of all people. Verse 8. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath He swore to your forefathers that He brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you. There's a word of redemption. Redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping His commandment of love to a thousand generations to those who love Him and keep His commands. Let me tell you what they're saying. The same thing Ephesians 3-14 through 14 said. You can't do it. But God can. That's why God chose you. Because He loved you before the foundations of the world. He loved you before your mama and your daddy, you know what I'm saying. Before that, He had already chose you to love you. Now, God unselfishly seeks us. And then He loves us. He is concerned for our good. Why is He concerned for our good? For His name's sake. God doesn't love us to get something from us. See, we love people out of selfishness, and that's not real love, but we portray it as love. 
God doesn't love us to get something from us because there is nothing that you can offer to God to make him go, wow. God just loves you because he is God. He is all powerful. He is all sufficient. And it's because God loves you that he chose you. Not because of what you did. Now let's just be honest here. You start peeling back the layers of your life. Are you really that good? Now you might be a good person. You might be a godly person. But when you really start peeling back layers. Like really? Like are you that good for real? None of us are that good. Because when when the real us is out in the open. Are you really that lovable? But God loved you anyway. God chose to love you. All right, back to Ephesians. Let me show you how nasty that you really are. I don't want you getting the big head thinking God chose me because I'm that good. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, who is you? <laughs> you. <laughs> As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. He double whammied you right there. What he's saying is you really ain't that good. All right, go there straight to Romans chapter 5. But stay in Romans for a minute because we're going to look at something else in Romans. Romans chapter 5. Very famous verse. You should already have this underlined or highlighted in your Bible. Romans 5, 8. But God, boy, the but God, that's a, good, that's a good phrase right there. But God, like you could just stop right there. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Whose love? His love. His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't love you because you're awesome. God loves you because he is awesome. God just loves you. There's no explaining it. Why is there no explaining it? Because you don't know how to explain God's love. The simple answer is, I don't know. He just loves you. That's it. He just loves you. Go over a couple pages of Romans chapter 8. I say Romans 8 and some of you panicked already. Romans 8, let's start in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor death, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice the phrase there, in Christ. Which, let me emphasize, you should be highlighting and underlining that when Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and all throughout Paul's writings. That phrase, in Christ. Now, a noticeable dimension of God's preserving us is that the believer is not spared from trials in life, but preserved in and through those trials. You're going to go through it. But God is going to get you through it. He ain't going to leave you hanging. That's how much He loves you. Like there is no promise in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible, there is no promise that we will not suffer. But there is a promise that God is going to walk through it with you. That's called love. That's how much God loves us. We are not lovable. But God loves us anyway. So if God chose us to be in him, he's going to make sure that you get through it. Charles Spurgeon said this, I have no question that God chose me, but I am quite sure 
that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I am sure he chose me before I was born or else he would never have chosen me afterwards. Ain't you glad that he chose you before he really knew how you was? Go to Matthew chapter 23. Jesus is in this big, long teaching to this group of people. It don't really say who. It just says in 23 verse 1, it said to the crowds. So that means there's a lot of people there. But what I want to pull emphasis on is the end of verse 23. So he, he, is, he has called out the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He's called them hypocrites. He's called them everything that you can think of. But this is what he says to them. Matthew 23 verse 37. Because I think this... This is on us. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Watch this. But you were not willing. You know what that means? That's on us. He said, he said I tried. But you wasn't willing. I tried to love you, but you wasn't willing. I, I tried to save you, but you wasn't willing. Now I'm going somewhere with this, so be patient. It is God's great desire that all men take refuge under His wings. When we sense the wooing of the Holy Spirit and we reject that, that ain't on God. That is clearly on us. I jump over to 2 Peter chapter 3. Bible drills tonight. Second Peter chapter 3. The jumping around will slow down here in a minute, I promise. Second Peter three verse nine. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, when you're chosen for something, that makes you feel good. See, when I was a kid, in the summertime, my mother would not allow us to sleep late, and she would not allow us to stay in the air conditioning playing video games all day. We literally had to be out of the house by 10 o'clock and not allowed to come back until the street lights came on. And I'm not making that up. Because the first one of us to go in and out, in and out, letting the cold air out, somebody was getting it when daddy got home. So we was really forced out of the house. And I probably, I am not making it up. But we lived in this rural neighborhood, which means it's a neighborhood kind of outside the city limits. So we had a neighborhood, and it was pretty easy to make friends. And most people in the neighborhood, you went to school with them anyway. So every single day, a group of us kids would get together. We'd either play baseball or basketball or football. We'd make a game up, make our rules up as we go so somebody left with a bloody nose. It always happened. But what we did was we would pick teams. And now kind of a general rule of thumb was we would take the two best athletes and make them captains so that they didn't get on the same team. Because if they got on the same team, they're going to win at everything they do. So we took the two best athletes made them captains, and then they got to pick. You go first, you go second. You go first, you go second. And it always felt good to be picked somewhere along the top. Now, if you was the odd man out, which means you had to have an even number of teams, if you was the odd man out and you didn't get picked, that was a terrible feeling. Because you had to sit out and wait till the next game to come. 
So it always felt good to be chosen. It always felt good when you pick for a team. Now, this is what I'm trying to tell you. With God, you don't got to sit out. With God, there is never this odd number where like, he's like, yeah, yeah, I don't know you or the flower pot. I'm going to take the flower pot. Like, you, we ain't got that. God has chosen you to be on his team. Here's the catch. You got to get on the team. He has said, I want you because I love you. But you get to pick whether or not you want to play on God's team. All right, back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. For he chose us. There's one of them words I want you to emphasize. For he chose us in him. And there's another phrase I want you to emphasize. Before the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. If you're a Christian tonight, it's because God chose you. If you're not, it's because you chose to reject God. And let me say that again because I don't think you got it. If you're a Christian, if, if, if Jesus is your Savior, it's because God chose you. If you are not saved, it's because you chose to reject God. The question is, are you chosen? You're the one that decides that. God wills that all men be saved. But what is the individual going to do about that? God says, I want you on my team. But you got to say, I'm going to sit this one out or I want to play. That's where predestination has that fine line. Verse 5. Kind of the end of verse 4 just to make it work. In love, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. But you can... Have a child by accident. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that one. But you cannot adopt a child by accident. When you adopt a child, you choose to love that child. You choose to care for that child. And when God adopts you, it's not by accident. He chose you and He chose to love you. He chose to care for you. He does it because He loves you and He wants to have an eternal relationship with you. I have been adopted. Not just by God, but by my earthly father. The dude that was my biological father was not in the picture. And I've told you the story a million times. But the man that adopted me, Charles Ferguson, Chose that. He picked me. And said. I'm going to love that kid. I'm going to whip him. But I'm going to love him. I'm going to take care of him. And on my wall in my office. Is the legalized documents. For my adoption. Don't ask me how I got them. Because I ain't supposed to have them. I worked out a deal with somebody. And they hooked me up. But that's legal stuff I ain't even supposed to have and it's got my name on it. But I got it hanging on my office. Not on my, in my office. To remind me of who I am. See, my last name wasn't Ferguson. It was Columns. But I was adopted. I was chosen. My last name got changed. Put that in a spiritual sense. You was chosen. So your name gets changed. So you ain't sinner no more. You're saint. And God might have to spank you sometimes. But you're still His child. Because He chose to love you. See, God makes us part of His family. He does it for His pleasure and His will. God chose to adopt you. But it cost him his son. Now he didn't get mad about it. But he did it. He killed Jesus. 
Because he wanted to have a relationship with you to show you how much that he loves you. Thomas Merton, an American monk from the early 1900s, said this, What am I? I am myself a word spoken by God. Now how we view ourselves, how we think of ourselves, determines the direction of our lives. Even within the Christian realm, even within church, we start to think that we can achieve this certain status to make God accept us, to embrace us. And we will do anything that we can just because we want God to love us. But you ain't got to do that because he done did it all anyway. He chose to embrace you. He chose to love you. He said that is enough. And that should within itself spark us to not live in all the insecurities that we continue to live in. Because at some point in all of our lives, I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord, at some point in all our lives, you have been really insecure about your salvation. Now watch how the Trinity works in all this. This is too good to leave out, and I don't want to blow over this. Verses 3 through 6 center around the Father. Watch this, watch this now. Verse 3 again. Praise be to God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He, He, that's God, chose us in Him, that's Christ, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight, that's God's sight, in love. He, pre, he God, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons, as God's sons, through Jesus Christ in accordance with God's pleasure and will, to the praise of God's glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. All right. Verses, also verse 6 through 12, center around the Son. So the first set centered around the Father. This centers around the Son. All right, let's just kind of pick up there in verse 6 and just roll with it. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. He knows one is capitalized. That's Jesus. In Him, that's Jesus. We have redemption through His blood, that's Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times would have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and under earth together under one head, even Christ in Him. That's Christ. We were also chosen have been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything into the conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. That's a lot. So we've got the Father, we got the Son, but there's another major important factor here. Verses 13 and 14. Watch how this revolves around the Holy Spirit. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you are marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. But it keeps going because it gets so good. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Now let's break this down even more. The Father purposes us. Verse 4 this time. Is it too much for y'all? Y'all all right? Gwen, you all right? Gwen, like, time out. <laughs> Sorry, Gwen, I had to call you. Verse 4, so the Father purposes, for He chose us in Him. Now, here's part of the purpose. Before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in His sight. All right, then the Son redeems us Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And then the Holy Spirit seals. Just verse 13 this time, just for the sake of time. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal. What is that seal? The promised Holy Spirit. Our salvation is the work of the Godhead. All three persons of God working for one person to save and to seal you. Why was this done for us? It's right there in the text. Notice the repeated phrase. The praise of His glory. Verse 6. 
to the praise of His glorious grace. Verse 12. The end of it. For the praise of His glory. Verse 14. The end of it. To the praise of His glory. Everything that God does in and through your life is for His glory. Not for you. It is for the glory of the Father so that He can say, look what I did. See, this even takes place in the Old Testament. See, in one of the most famous passages ever, that, that some of you could quote the whole psalm, but let's just look at it anyway, Psalm 23. Just one verse out of there, because I want to show you that this is for God. Well, matter of fact, let, let's just start in verse, let's start in verse 1, let's look at more than one verse, because it's just too good. So if you were to break Psalm 23 down, verses 1 through 3 are about God. Verses 4 through 6 are to God. You kind of notice, you can study that on your own sometime and notice how it's worded, but 1 through 3 is about God. 4 through 6 is like to God. Right, but 1 through 3. Just, just notice the wording here. You know, very famous passage. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. What Now watch this. Verse 2. He makes me. He being God, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He, God, God is the one. He leads me beside quiet waters. Verse 3, He is the one who restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness. For what? Look at the end of verse 3. For His name's sake. God does it for God. You get the benefit, but God is doing it for Him. His namesake, His glory. But even your salvation is for the glory of God. You were chosen and you were purposed by God, by the power of God, for the glory of God. Verse 4 in Ephesians 1 answers the question simply by this. To be holy and blameless. That's why you're saved. Not for you, but to protect you. For God. So that God can say, yeah, they got sin in their life. But they're holy and blameless. I chose them. So when the devil come knocking on your door, I'm already saved, brother. Yeah, but you did this last week. I know. But when God looks at me, I'm holy and blameless. That's a promise straight out the Bible. So there's God's providence. There's also God's power. We experience God's power as it makes us holy and blameless. We find the source of that power in the phrase in Ephesians 1, in Christ, which occurs over 20 times just in that letter. So to live in Christ is to live to the praise of God's glory. It is to fulfill the mission that God has for your life and fulfill the mission that God has for the church. Can I take you one more place tonight? John chapter 17. This is the last place, I promise. You've been really good tonight. <laughs> I got a patch on the back, so I've been hollering at you. And then people watching online lives like, yeah, I ain't never going to that church. They do hollers too much. Now, God does it for His glory. And Jesus proves this in how he prays. Well, I, there's one word I want you to notice in John 17, verses 1 through 5. First thing I want you to notice, if you got a cheater Bible, before verse 1 of chapter 17, it should say something like, Jesus prays for himself. Now, this is what I want you to get. There's one word, two sayings, but one word, glory or glorify. That's what I want you to get out of this text. So the Gospel of John, verse 17, starting in verse 1. After Jesus said this, He looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify Your Son, that Your Son may glorify You. For You granted Him authority over all people, that He might give eternal life to those, or to all those You have given Him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know 
you. Now we're going to get to knowing God in a couple weeks, so that's going to be key. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you. When? Before the world began. That's what God wants you to be a part of. Listen. The words chosen, adopted, and predestined scare us. But they shouldn't. If you're saved, those words should fuel your confidence in the Lord. Those words should spark something inside of you that makes you want to pursue Jesus every single day. Because He chose you. That should make you want to have a relationship with Jesus. Listen, the doctrine of election is that those who freely come to God are those God has freely chosen. But th this is one of those doctrines that is not easy to accept. It has given thoughtful believers problems for centuries. It has kept me up at night. Like when I was praying earlier, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 scares me because it can split a church in a minute. But we're going to be careful with those 14 verses. And during our time in Ephesians, we will be careful not to choose sides one way or the other. The plan for the book of Ephesians is to just lay out the Scriptures verse by verse and let God work on your heart Especially through those verses. Archibald Alexander Hodge. You heard of him, right? <laughs> you know, I don't know what that is. Anyway, he was a Presbyterian minister in the 1800s. And, and this is what he said pretty much about predestination and being chosen and all that. Now, it's kind of funny, so stay with me. Does God know the day you'll die? Yes. He, he, he dialogues with himself in this quote, so just stay with me. Does God know the day you'll die? Yes. Has He appointed that day? Yes. Can you do anything to change that day? No. Then why do you eat? To live. What happens if you don't eat? You die. Then if you don't eat and die, would that be the day God has appointed for you to die? And then He says, quit asking stupid questions and just eat. Does God know everything? Yes, or he would not be all-knowing. Is God self-existing without origin? Yes, or he would not be infinite. Is God all-powerful? Yes, or he would not be omnipotent. I just want to tell you this story and we'll be done. So a boy was given a sailboat by his father for his birthday. The boy took the sailboat out to the lake to play with the sailboat. And it, you know, that's kind of like a, a kite. You know, it's got a string. So the boy was out there playing with the sailboat when the wind came up. It broke his string and Blew his sailboat away. Well, several weeks go by. Little boy just had to be walking through town. He walked by the toy store and he noticed in the window of the toy store his sailboat. So he goes inside. And he tells the store owner, he said, that boat in the window, that, that's my boat. I lost that boat. The store owner says, I'm sorry, son, but that's my boat. Somebody brought that in here the other day and I bought it from them. So it's my boat. The heartbroken little boy goes home and he tells his daddy, my boat's in the window down at the toy store and the man won't give it to me. So the father gives his son the money to buy back his own boat. So the next day he does that. Listen, that is a picture of what God has done for us. God bought you back because he wants you. The word redemption in the Greek means this, to buy back for the purpose of setting free. That's what it's about. Man, that was a lot of information. It's like drinking out of the fire hydrant. But man, let me, let me pray for you and we'll let you get on out of here. Look, and I didn't even holler at you but for about 45 minutes. Father, thank you for your word. Father, it's tough. That's a tough one. But Father, You are the author. You are the perfecter of life. And God, as we 
go through this book uh, together. Just remind us that these are your words. These are not my words or no other human being's words. These, these come from you. And just let us be mindful of that. So Father, just open up the Scriptures to us. Reveal Yourself to us. And God, every time that, that, that we read whatever in our Bibles, that You would just show Yourself faithful to us. Reveal something new to us as we go through this. Father, we love You, God. Just thank You for Jesus. And God, I want to thank You that You chose us. We didn't choose You, but You chose us to be adopted as sons and daughters. So, Father, thank You for that. We love You. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you have a great week.